Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome CEO of CBS International US. Bienvenue au PDG de Sofia Bekele. Merci. Bonjour. Je suis content d'être ici. Nous aurons une session sur l'Afrique vue par les États-Unis et une discussion entre les États-Unis et l'Afrique. Chat, nous regarderons les différents aspects entre la Californie et l'Afrique. Les deux messieurs qui sont ici pour partager ce qu'ils pensent de à partir de Washington, Robert Wolf, le président et fondateur de 32 Advisors, ancien président de UBS America et conseiller spécial, euh, trois fois nommé par le président Obama, euh, y compris au sein du euh, Conseil économique. Dante Paradiso, chargé d'affaires et chef de mission adjoint à l'ambassade des États-Unis au Gabon. Donc, comment Washington peut mieux faire. By all indications, it would seem Africa is in a place to be in the next 100 um, years for good reasons for that. So uh, please share with us some of the thoughts of how Africa is perceived, uh, I mean, U.S. is perceived um, by Africa. Uh, for example, how can Africa maximize the benefits of working more efficiently with the United States? Some questions like what are the opportunities that are most easily accessible and how can we build partnership on both sides? And what can Africa expect from USA and in the future? I will start with you, uh, Mr. Wolf. Great, Wolf. Thank you, and uh, once again, it's uh, great to be on stage and uh, congratulations to um, the entire Gabon country, as well as President Bongo, and obviously the Adius family and the work they've done. I think, and I mentioned the other day, that it, it really starts with getting to know each other. I think all partnerships begin when you look at someone in the eyes and you say, that's someone I want to work with. I think we are growing together, maybe uh, more slowly than the Africa continent would want. Some countries are uh, achieving better success with the U.S. than others. Uh, in the U.S., it's kind of a simple philosophy, and uh, I was able to meet with President Bongo uh, today one-on-one, -on -one, and it starts with a great leader, and I think uh, Gabon has a real great visionary, and it starts with rule of law. And I think when you look around the various countries uh, within Africa, the 50-plus, the question is, how many are U.S. investors comfortable in going into? And I think there's a great value proposition for many of the countries in Africa, and I think time is our friend. Um, I don't think that we should say things need to happen overnight. We think it can move f more quickly, more forward. But it starts with network like these where you can talk openly about education, poverty, health care, public-private partnerships, and all the good things that have been discussed the last three days. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the initiatives that uh, the President uh, has started for Africa with the upcoming August um, uh, launch of some of them, the, the Power Africa, Trade Africa, that sort of things. What well, is that came about? How did that come about? What is the response? What are they responding to? Well, I, I think it's clear that we live in a world today that has slower growth. Um, we are, many of the countries and continents around the world are post-recession. Europe is incredibly slow. China has slowed from their double digits growth. The U.S. moved from one and a half to, you know, maybe two and a half. Whereas Africa has had very consistent GDP growth. So one is, um, of course we want the entire world to grow. The more the world grows, the biggest economy in the world, the U.S., will grow more as well. I think uh, both sides have an uh, initiative for foreign direct investment. What is the best way to get private capital into a new country? You need efficient infrastructure, and I know that's something that Gabon is working on. You also need public-private partnerships where the right government involvement takes place, whether it's the Africa Development Bank, the Africa Exim Bank, the U.S. Exim Bank, OPIC, and whatever it may be. And then the third thing is, 
everyone wants to export more. So what are the real um, product and services that U.S. can help implement into Africa and make them best in class and vice versa? And there's certainly some great things, whether it's energy, agriculture, technology we're bringing, water treatment capability. Um, but by no means do I want to be idealistic and say we're where we want to be. We both sides have uh, incredible amounts of improvement. Excellent. Any thoughts on, on this, Mr. Paredes? Sure. Um, first of all, let me just say uh, uh, thanks uh, to the President uh, for hosting our, our mission here. Uh, an embassy relies on uh, its contacts with the government to uh, get its work done. Uh, there are, you know, one of the nice things about being up on stage today is there's so many uh, friends and colleagues in the audience uh, from the DIPCOR and the presidency, and also uh, the, the government as a whole. Uh, and of course, I want to say a, a, a warm uh, thank you to the Gabonese people uh, for continuing to help us build uh, good, close ties uh, with your country. Um, you know, from a, from a standpoint of uh, U.S. government policy toward Africa, it's a very, very, uh, we have, we're built on four pillars. Uh, those four pillars are strengthening democratic institutions, uh, helping boost uh, trade and investment with the continent, uh, helping Africa uh, meet its uh, secure, our mutual security challenges, uh, and of course, promoting opportunity. Uh, in a number of areas, you mentioned uh, uh, Power Africa and Trade Africa. Uh, those are two good examples of initiatives that we've put together uh, on a select basis with uh, uh, a smaller number of countries that we hope to expand over time. Uh, Power Africa is uh, designed to bring together pub public-private partnerships, uh, help African countries get access to uh, U.S. credit facilities uh, and mechanisms for credit that can deliver power which, of course, is a uh, key driver of economic activity and growth. Uh, the Trade Africa is specific uh, largely in East Africa, and it's designed to help uh, you know, East African and other African countries uh, consolidate uh, trade among themselves, uh, because we found that uh, where countries are trading among themselves, you get uh, a, a bunch of benefits. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Paradisio. This particular trade, Africa, I've read, there are skeptics, obviously, just like the power Africa. And one of the issues we have here in Africa is the integration, the regional integration. Uh, obviously, you know, the political security and economic development is very important for the U.S. administration, especially in the East African region. So um, how do you see this uh, trade Africa be successful with issues that we're facing with integration. And then, of course, U.S. Uh, companies also like to invest in larger markets, not just in one country. So uh, unless that had successfully integrated, it may be a setback. So that's its skeptics. And how do you view that? Well, I, I think over time, we've seen that uh, most uh, trade blocks, uh, we have uh, distinguished uh, former presidents from Latin America here uh, who, who will tell you uh, uh, that economic integration has led to the economies of scale that can attract investment. It also leads to a harmonization of law, uh, and that and the regulatory environment in particular is really necessary to attracting investment because, uh, as Robert can tell you, you know you need some certain certainty in your costs. And if everybody understands the rules of the game, uh, you can build out the economies of scale. Uh, it's something that President Bongo and Dimba is focused on here because in Gabon. You have tremendous uh, resources. You've got an educated population. Uh, you've got a youthful population. So there's tremendous uh, opportunities in a country like Gabon. But you also only have 1.5 million people. So he rightfully understands that uh, the greater the economic integration and the role that a country like Gabon can play in that, uh, then a company can come in uh, and they can say, OK, this is a platform by which we're going to access and, and, uh, and, and scale up. Uh, throughout the rest of the area. Uh, one very quick private sector example is if you wanted to open an American fast food chain here, you could be very profitable in Gabon, but you would have maybe one or two franchises uh, in Libreville, and then you'd probably have one in Port Chanty. 
So what you want to do is be able to say, hey, we can open 50 of these, and we're going to give you profit margins in 50, because that's where we're looking in Europe, we're looking in Asia, and we're looking in, uh, in our own country or Latin America. So you have to have the economies of scale, and that's what Trade Africa and other initiatives like that are designed to instill. Robert? Excellent. Let me just ask you one question, Mr. Wolf, and go to the audience if you have uh, questions. China, China's relationship with uh, Africa has really neutralized U.S.'s role. Uh, and obviously, um, Africa has uh, an extremely long relationship with the USA. Uh, 200 billion uh, was last year uh, the top trading partner for China. That's a staggering number. And U.S.'s budget is not nearly one third of that. So could you comment on any impact this is having on the U.S. approach to Africa, both in the public and the private sector? Great. Well, first I just have to say, isn't this like the coolest bracelet you've ever seen that's made in Gabon? When I go home, there's going to be a food fight at my house who gets it. So I just want to let everyone, that should be the best picture that comes out of here. Good. But I want to um, thank you for asking. I would, um, I would take the frame neutralize in the United States, and I'd probably put that in different quotes than you would put that. Okay. Um, First of all, there's no question what China is doing around the world for inbound investment has been a, an incredible change. Um, it used to be where U.S. dominated foreign direct investment around the world. Now they're competing with Brazil, China, Mexico, Canada, and everywhere around the world. What I would say is that I think the, uh, the countries in Africa have to understand that everyone comes into Africa in a different way. China may come in leading with money, but they also lead with their employees and their materials. So the question someone has to ask themselves, is that moving the needle enough for GDP growth in that region? On the flip side, when you need money, it's as good as dollars anyone else's. I would say, away from that, the U.S. is also understanding that Africa is a great region to come in, focusing on energy and agriculture. But everyone seems to be very excited about these 30, 40, 50 percent returns. And all I will say is someone who's been on Wall Street for 30 years, those are incredibly high returns with incredible high risk reward. Some people like and accept that risk versus the reward, and some people may want to go into something more stable. So I would say that over time, I think there'll be an immense amount of new investment in Africa. The Carlyle Group just closed a $500 million fund that was increased to $700 million, and then even they're oversubscribed. So I think, um, I think the jury is still out. Um, the build in Africa is, is relatively new still. Excellent. That's the Carlyle Group is the, for the power initiative, correct? Correct. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any questions we're taking from the audience, please? There is one over there. That one over there. This is a, a question for both Mr. Paradiso and Mr. Wolf. Africa is trying to transform itself in industrialize. Do you actually see a significant trend in the U.S. private sector to support uh, this African aspiration towards industry and transformation? We know that most of U.S. private sector has been focusing on oil, mining, and other commodities. But we are now trying to move beyond that, industrialize, diversify, and transform. Thank you. Okay, I'll just take it very quickly. Um, yes, uh, as, a, as a matter of U.S. government policy through the African Growth and Opportunity Act, we've created conditions whereby uh, African manufacturing can have access on, on preferential basis to uh, the U.S. market. So, there's no question that. In terms of private sector support for that, there is no question there's interest. Uh, 
the question is, uh, can the, are the conditions set in each country to ensure the return on uh, investment and return on equity comes back? And I'll, I'll kick it over to you so, for the private um, sector. Not surprisingly, I may be a little outside the box here and maybe give a little advertisement for my firm. But at 32 Advisors, we want Africa, Gabon, other countries to be cutting edge. One of our service lines are drones as a service provider. So for example, it's key to have economic diversification within Africa away from commodities and minerals. One thing we're discussing right now um, as we speak today is how do you use drones better for tourism, whether it's national parks, wildlife surveillance, much more efficient than sometimes wildlife rangers going into the jungle themselves. Secondly, right. agriculture, okay. incredibly important for this country. When you think about it, one of the things we're pitching is drones can actually think, look in a much more efficient way as productivity. You can look at irrigation, water levels, pesticide, fungicide. You may have a thousand meter, no, no, square no, meter no. Um, farm, but maybe 30% maybe you shouldn't actually field. You know, energy and refinery, uh, border control, there's so many ways, and I actually think Africa can be at the forefront of how it's you Africa use today. drones it's to Africa increase today. productivity and efficiency. Going back to your question about what we think there can be great things to do together, I mean, obviously, and everyone said it, I mean, Gabon has multiple projects going on at, the one, at one time, but infrastructure is in, an incredible key to success. People want to know when they come in, they can get their goods and services to the places they need to go on a timely basis. Mr. We have Wolf. the same problems in the United States. Thank you very much. Let me just ask one question, probably a general question everybody is looking forward to. What is the perception of Africa to the U.S.? If you could um, answer that, Mr. I Curtis. appreciate that. That's a, it's a great question. It was one of the topics that was listed here. Um, I think it's important for everybody to understand, much as Africa is an extremely diverse continent and there's a great deal of diversity within each country, uh, the United States is also an extremely diverse country. So when we talk about perceptions, uh, the first thing we find is that if you go and, and try to look and, okay, what, what do Americans think of Africa? Actually, you're gonna find that uh, the question is as diverse as Americans. So that people who are in the private sector, for example, uh, if you're in the hydrocarbon industry, you know a great deal about Africa. You've dealt with a lot of African countries uh, for a long time. If you're in the development business or the security business, you have a real good sense of different countries and different cultures. Uh, in other areas, uh, you may not be as familiar. So I think everybody needs to understand that it's, it's extremely important that uh, we have a very diverse uh, dialogue among different constituencies. And another big contributor to uh, to our conception in America of what Africa is, what individual African countries are, are our diaspora. Uh, we have a great many Africans uh, living in the United States. We have more than a million and a half people that are directly of uh, recent African origin, uh, and obviously we're about 14% of our population uh, has uh, African heritage. So, uh, you know, our perceptions of Africa are very much formed by uh, the individual experiences uh, that we bring. You know what, I'll, not surprisingly, I'll be a little bold. I'd say it a little differently. Uh, U.S. doesn't know enough about Africa. Um, I've been, thank you. I've been here for three days, and I go back with a wealth of knowledge that I can't read in a book. There's no question that the covers we see are all pretty and nice. But actually, reading between that, there you go, I'm supposed to, the band's coming in. But reading the, the, the lines in the book tell a much better story. There is so much going on, and there's so much opportunity. And I think at the end of the day, we have to become, as a country, more educated about the opportunities in Africa. And I joked today, uh, when I met with the president, I decided to come to Africa between my yellow fever shot, my polio boost, my malaria pills, and two other pills I keep taking. And in some ways, it's like, okay, should I be coming? But I should tell you that my son will be in Botswana to help build a school next month. So I believe that this is a great place uh, to have our kids come, 
and for me to come back to and learn more. I think you couldn't have said it more. We're running out of time. Thank you. But, uh, America does need to be engaged. One of the initiatives, the Obama initiative, is to that youth leadership initiative that he started, taking African leaders from Africa and educating them in America. But we, America should have that Peace Corps concept where they would be sending actually Americans to Africa so that they will be also trained on what Africa is. And I think you made you know, uh, a very good point to that. I would just like to say something on behalf of uh, America. We are thinking every day about what's going on with the girls in Nigeria. Yeah. And we hope okay. that comes to a, a peaceful and quick conclusion. Thank you. Thank you for that great conversation, gentlemen. Uh, we have ended our session. Thank you.